Welcome, Welcome back to the table, my friends. We have all arrived. Are we cheersing? Cheers. Sorry, only for tea. Cheers. 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 All right. Oh, I'm so sorry. AJ. Don't leave AJ. Whoa, don't I know. I'm I was gonna a get little both of AJ's about things. That. Oh, it's my bad. My bad. Well, AJ's like. Two it I'm three. He is. He's three. He has three. Why do you have ice water in a regular one? Because I'm pouring my non Don't ice judge water him. into my cold he's water. He's bougie. He can't speak. He's bougie. like you. <laughs> 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 As I have my own He had to make his own coffee. <laughs> I, did, I did not realize you were doing Starbucks coffee. He, no. Yes, he made his own Keurig coffee when I made a pot, but he didn't know what kind of coffee it was, so he made his own Keurig. But he's not bougie. But yeah. he's not bougie. <laughs> I'm not bougie. <laughs> no, not at all. Mm. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about um, the, the Jewish feasts and festivals, and it's going to be a lot of fun. And in honor of that, our opening question for the night is, I want to know what your favorite holiday is. Do we all have to go? Yes, you all have Christmas. to go. No! <laughs> Take it back. <laughs> hey, my Google, call, my Google calls me the king of Christmas. <laughs> okay, you got to tell me why, though. You get to program that. Oh, okay. Christmas because I like all the traditions and things that come with Christmas and it's just like I love winter and it's cozy and I like get to be inside and spend it with my family and it's just fun. King Christmas? <clears throat> I like Christmas because Christmas is the best. Um, when I grew up, Boom. my mom <laughs> made Christmas uh, very magical for us. Um, like. You know, a lot of times you get things like, what's your favorite childhood memory? And it, most people have like specific, but mine was just Christmas. Because it was just magical and fun and it was great and I loved it and the family was there and it was always such good times. And so I have continued that with my family and I'm sure you're gonna say Christmas as well, so. Yeah, mine's Christmas, shocking. Because, <laughs> wow. I mean, you know, all of that and you know, being a pastor, I have to say, because it's Jesus' birthday, too. <laughs> <laughs> if you've never been to Jeff's house at Christmas time, he has all the Christmas villages and every Christmas tree that you could ever think of. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, and you're not lights. Lights. Mine. Oh. <laughs> okay. 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 Mine's the newest holiday. Uh-oh. Juneteenth? For real? I was like, <laughs> I mean, good for you if it is, but that's a little confusing. No. <laughs> Mine's a tie. Mine's a tie. Oh my uh -huh. gosh. Mine's a tie. I had to do it. I was going to say, well, you know, but. But no, mine's a tie between Easter and Christmas. Okay. And just, I mean, I think it's just not. I mean, yeah, you know, you're. Easter, you're celebrating his resurrection, and then. Christmas you're celebrating his birth. But not only that, it's just that I think that's the two main ones that we're always all together as a family. Mm -hmm. And like Christmas with my grandma, I mean, it was just, oh my gosh, it was like the house just bled Christmas. I mean, it was like it was coming out of the walls, out of the carpet, it was everywhere. So I think that's why. Just mm -hmm. that. mm -hmm. And we try to do that at the house, and it's just, we have a village and it's actually still. Does it stay up all year? My dad, our stays up. My dad stays up That's all awesome. year. That's awesome. But now my dad's is like this table and another table. Ooh. It takes wow. up the whole. That's it's wild. like a whole room. He used yeah. to have it. It's a room. And he'd put it out there and it was intricate. Mm -hmm. Trains and a sky lift and. They get styrofoam and he would like sculpt it so that it would be. Wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. That's intense. It is. I want. Yeah. She was two real, when she left. Real little, when we left so. Northwood, she was two. It was right before her second birthday. Yeah. Have the young They were in my youth group. I, they were the first wedding I ever performed. <laughs> Who else? Thanksgiving. Because it's the only time of year that I get to see my dad's family. That's cool. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And you get to eat a lot. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. It's a little low. Yeah, it's a lower pressure. Unless you're the one cooking the turkey. Yeah. And then or hosting. I mean, my grandma always made a big deal of it, and I'd help her put up her villages and all that. So I have all those memories um, and doing the 12 days of Christmas, and my grandma always went all out. So kind of like your grandma, mm -hmm. sounds like. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, it's just, I love that time of year because everyone is just so giving. Everything is about wanting to make somebody else happy, it feels like. And I just like the lights. Yeah. One more thing. <laughs> have you discovered Skinny Tree yet? No. <laughs> skinny Tree. Okay, you've got the trees, but they take up so much room. Right? But if you get the little tree, it's still. But Skinny Tree, you can get like a four or five foot tall Skinny Tree, but it's skinny, so it doesn't go way, way out. But you can still hang a bunch to give of stuff her the around there. Name. She's typing in. Oh, it's tree a right <laughs> something, <laughs> something Bristol pine. Yeah, Bristol pine. Some, I have three skinny trees. I asked for skinny tree for Christmas so that I could have them for the next year, and I got two of them. So now I have three. I have a big tree. I have two, three skinny trees, and then I have a lot of little trees and other. I told you. But like skinny trees. tree is. I have a huge, like thirteen foot. Ours is nine and a half. How much, how much and at, the and at, during COVID, Nine, I ten. didn't want to take it down, so I did a January tree, and then I did a <laughs> <laughs> you, you put hearts on and it, and then you... And then I got to, well, in fact, at, at um, Valentine's Day, everybody put something, pop, like, something they appreciated. Or they Aww, that's cool. Aww, that's they were, cool. They were hearts. But then we got to Easter, and I was done. I was like, <laughs> I just thought of this. We just um, we have a little cabin up in Clayton, and we decided to Airbnb it. And guess what? It is. It's a Christmas cabin. <gasps> and my husband um, decided he was going to do a, his his family used to have a Christmas farm tree, Christmas tree farm. So he decided he was going to put some on this and call it Culver's Culver's Christmas Tree Farm because that's what his grandpa was. So he bought like thirty trees and he planted them. And they're like this big. And we're down to like 10 because he keeps running over on like a lawn. With the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody comes to the Culver Christmas tree farm, they're going to look around and go, where are these trees? Oh, they're right there. They're only this big. <laughs> it's like, twin. Yeah, I'm <laughs> but the cabin oh, the has cabin. all the trucks, you know, and mm -hmm. the, it's not a lot. It's not like overkill there, but it's super cute. That's so that cute. I should tell you that I love Christmas. So. Yeah, that's yes. fun. Christmas that's there that's fun. Like, Right, you too. Um, mine is Halloween, just because I like all the costumes and just fun. Yeah. Yeah, Halloween is fun. I like Arbor Day. <laughs> <laughs> These trees are cool. Pearl Harbor now. Oh um, my god. <laughs> What do you say? What all, which Pearl also Harbor. happens to be his birthday. Oh. Um, so now, I have two. I have 4th of July and Christmas because it's the best of both worlds you have. Me being the pyromaniac who loves fire and explosives, so Fourth of July is great, and also it's the time that I get to hang out with my friends the most, as far as the holiday-wise. And then you have Christmas, which I think is the most coziest, and the ones you I get to hang out with my family. Mm. So. Well, so were you on the roof last night? No, mm -hmm. I would not get invited, so I left. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, just go up there. Dude, it was no, like we actually had to go grocery shopping. It was actually really good. <laughs> it was. Awesome. It was a video. Better than I thought it would be. And then we kind of stopped. I'm like, okay, they're done. So we go get, go to reach a little bit. Ah, ah, it went on for a long time. Yeah, we were like, what is it going to end? And she said, have you gone left yet? And we're like, no, because she don't like to, if she's out, she don't like to go into the house by herself. Got dark. Mm -hmm. And so we're like, we're like, oh, no, we're still here. And she's like, okay, we're going to go Goodness, this is like the, the linear islands. How many fireworks do you have? <laughs> uh, there were a lot. Yeah. Yeah, we were sitting there and they I kept going them. off. And I was like, they just need to come over and take a bow so we know it's yeah. over. Right? Yeah, yeah. Finally, <laughs> Patrick walked up the edge and said, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, see, it worked. That's funny. All right. Well, mine is Christmas. I already said that. But um, 
Christmas is just, I don't know, seems to be passing down the tradition of making it really magical. Um, and my middle name is Noel, so I feel like I have to love Christmas. I mean, I have to. Like, it's, it's my birthright, you know? And, uh, yeah, so I love Christmas. So, we're going to pick up where we left off last night. Um, Jesslyn, I know you weren't here last night, but we started talking about how the table is really significant. And throughout scripture, there's all of these meals and gatherings that happen um, that really signify a lot of different things and are really important. And so we left off yesterday um, with the end of the first meal um, after Adam and Eve have left the garden. Um, and just a little summary, in the early pages of Genesis, humanity is invited to a meal that gives life right? It's all around the tree of life relationship with God. And then throughout the Bible, meals instructed by God both mark the covenant promises that he gives with his people and they invite his people to never forget his love and faithfulness toward them. So they're to remember the fact that he alone is their true source of life. So like we said last night, it's always pointing back to he's the true source of life, to that original meal. He is the source of life, but also pointing forward to the day when he will restore that goodness for us. So that's where we're going to pick up today. And remember our big question we kind of left with last night was, will people continue to define goodness on their own terms? Or are they going to receive the true life that God authors? Um, and so before we jump into um, the Jewish feasts and festivals, I want to talk about covenants for a second. Because all of the Jewish feasts and festivals are underneath one particular covenant in scripture. Um, but covenant is this word we don't use a lot, really, in our culture outside of scripture and even sometimes not even then. Um, so somebody give me your best understanding of what a covenant is or what it means. I'd say like a rule, because like, you know, in neighborhoods you have covenants, which is like rules that you have to like, you can't have this and that and this, you know. So I'd say something like a, like a rule, like a commandment type situation. Yeah. Anybody else want to add to that? I'd say like also like, a commitment to like abide by that, mm -hmm. like when you enter into a covenant, you're yeah. committing to follow that rule. Yeah. And it's it's the unbreakable vow. Yeah. Because it's it's not determined by if the other person agrees or not. You, it's an unbreakable agreement to follow this no matter what. Mm -hmm. It's not like a con, just a contract that you can get out of. Yeah. It's a promise for forever. Yeah, so covenant, it's, it's this agreement, it's a contract, but it is, it has this deep level of understanding that it is unconditional. So that if one party of this breaks their uh, part of the agreement, the contract isn't void and broken, it still stays. And so covenant is such a significant um, part of scripture because over and over and over we said that God makes these agreements, makes these promises, um, gives these laws to his people and over and over and over they break them. They fall away from them. They decide that they're not going to hold up their end of the deal and yet God still comes back every time and keeps his end of the deal. Um, and so the Jewish feasts and festivals are all part of one of the covenants that we find in scripture. Um, but I want to lay out for you guys, um, just quickly, cause it's, it's good information to know the six covenants that we find, um, throughout scripture and what they really are. And most of them you're going to find in the old Testament. Um, but the first one that we start with is the covenant with creation. So the covenant with creation is this divine relationship that, you know, God established with creation. That I am creator, you are my created, um, but that doesn't mean I just lord and rule over you. It means we are, we are co-creators, right? We're doing this together. And all of that is represented through Adam, right? It's, it's really between God and everybody and everything that's ever created, but Adam is the representative of that. And so our part in that covenant is to fill and subdue the earth. That's our role. 
fill and subdue. And so this agreement is kind of the foundation for all of the covenants that will come forward. So obviously Adam breaks this covenant when he sins, when they eat the fruit, um, and the rest of the covenants are almost subsets of this one. And ultimately all of the covenants are meant to restore what this original one was meant to be. So as we walk through and you see the different agreements, are you just changing it because I'm writing yeah. over here? Um, yeah, so so this one, we are always trying to get back to this. Always back to this. Always back to this. You'll hear um, phrases of people in scripture being the new Adam or the second Adam. It's always trying to get back to this original covenant. So the second one is the flood covenant or the, if you want to be fancy, the Noahic covenant. And obviously this one is between God and Noah. And he is called and referred to as the second Adam. So the flood really is almost a new creation story, right? God promises that he will wipe out the earth and he is starting again with Noah and with his family. And then he promises to never flood the earth again. So this is almost like, like a reset or a restart for redemption. So that's the second covenant. Now the third one is where we get into Abraham. And it gets a little more specific. So this is the Abrahamic covenant. And obviously it's between God and Abraham. But more so than that, looking to the future, it's between God and the nation of Israel. That he promises that... I'm going to grow this nation from you, Abraham, and eventually I'm going to rescue your people and I will give your people the promised land. You will be my blessed people. And the big deal with this covenant is that instead of picking a particular person to work through, he does work through Abraham, but he says, I'm going to have a whole nation of people who will then be blessed and redeemed through Abraham and then through those people, the true Adam will come, the true Redeemer. So already, way back in here, you see foreshadowing to Jesus. But this is all about the people of Israel um, and who they are, that they are God's people. So we know that they're God's people, and there's kind of a break in the stories here where we see um, Isaac and Jacob and their stories you know, expanding, and then we finally get to the story of Joseph the Israelites end up in Egypt, and then they find themselves in captivity there. So then we find the next covenant that after Moses delivers them from Egypt and pulls them out of Egypt, we get the Mosaic covenant or the Mosaic law, if you want to write it that way, or the Sinai covenant, some people will call it because Mount Sinai is where God gave Moses the law. Um, and so, like I said, this is between God and the people of Israel, but really the big thing to note here is this is where they received the law. Um, you can find the story of that in Exodus, but really the law itself is going to be in the book of Leviticus. That's where you'll find that. Um, and so this one is a little, a little trippy for people because it, it then comes to the rules, right? It's about the rules and the regulations. But this, this covenant here kind of loses its meaning if you forget the relationship with God or you forget the context of which it came. So this comes right on the heels of these people being um, freed from slavery in Egypt and now they're kind of camping out waiting for God to tell them what to do. And so all of these laws are in through the lens of, I am the Lord who's brought you out of slavery. And this is how I'm going to set you apart as a people. This law was never meant to be salvation. It wasn't meant to be like working to get to God. It was so that these people were different and set apart. That's what the word holy means, his holy people. They were set apart for God's purposes so that they would be kind of his light to the nations around them. Um, and a lot of this was about blessing and cursing is a big theme in this one here and that was based upon obedience or disobedience if you're obedient there will be blessings if you are disobedient there will be curses 
And so, like I said, it's much less about salvation as it is you guys are supposed to meet my light to the world. And so these are the standards that I have for you to, to be set apart and just to live life better. I mean, the more you learn about God and then you look back at like the crazy wackadoodle laws that he had in the Old Testament, like they make sense for keeping people safe and clean and all of these different things that, that people didn't know back then. Um, so that's the fourth one is the Mosaic Covenant. And that one goes on for a really long time until we get to the Davidic covenant. And like I said, these don't really replace each other, but they almost are subsets. We're getting a more clear picture of what God's plan is as we go down the line here. And so the Davidic covenant is, is the promise that, um, that David's descendant will be king of kings, pretty much. So it, it prophesied that not only from the family of Abraham, not only from uh, somebody who is part of God's family and under the Mosaic law, but that the Messiah, the one who is to be king of kings and lord of lords and come and rescue God's people um, from the law, was going to be someone from David's direct line and descendants. And so these are the first five, and all of those really are our Old Testament covenants. But you see kind of the progression of over and over again. They're just trying to get back to the original relationship that we had with God. And then finally, the sixth covenant is going to be, we just call it the New Covenant. And actually, fun fact, the word testament, our Old and New Testament, the word testament actually just means covenant. So when you read the Old Testament, you're just reading what was under the Old Covenant with God. And when we get to the New Testament, you're reading what's under the New Covenant with God, the new agreement, the new rules. So this is obviously the one that was established by Jesus' death and resurrection. Um, this one focuses much more on the forgiveness of sins, on the renewal of our individual hearts, um, and on intimacy with God. And the cool thing, or what I think is the cool thing, if I can spell this correctly, is that this new covenant is actually the fulfillment of all of the rest of these. See, in this covenant, Jesus is the, the perfect and new Adam. Bless you. Um, he is the one who's going to restart humanity and bring a new order and a new creation. He is the one who's going to establish and redefine the boundaries of who God's people are. He fulfills all the things in the law that we could never live up to. Um, and of course, he comes to rule as king. So all of these are set up kind of uh, bit by bit and people by people and generation by generation, ultimately to get us here to this new covenant that we now live under um, with Jesus because he fulfills all of these things. And so this is the covenant that we still live under. Um, this is our agreement with God. And so, um, yeah, so those are the six covenants. And um, I want to take a couple minutes to do that today just because I think it's so important for us to understand why this is laid out this way. Um, and so, like I said, we're going to look at the Jewish feasts and festivals. Honestly, all of these covenants are really marked by important meals. Um, but we don't have time to go through all of those things. And so, can anybody tell me, does anybody know under which covenant the Jewish feasts and festivals are established? Or just take a guess. Would Passover be on the Mosaic? No, it would be the Abraham. It's mosaic. mosaic, yes. So this is what we're going to be looking at tonight. It's part of the Mosaic Law. Um, did I leave that as a blank on your thing? Yes, the yeah. seven or eight, we'll talk about it. There's really seven, but there's kind of an addendum, eight. Feasts and festivals of Israel are part of the Mosaic Covenant. Now don't flip your paper yet. Don't flip it. Okay. Always noting that one. I know, I know. You should Working actually, ahead. You should actually just throw them out. Yeah, get out. You're not allowed here anymore. You're bad. Just kidding. Um, okay, so yeah, so they're established under the Mosaic Covenant because that was the one where God basically set 
all of the rules and regulations for all of life. Um, so again, that's in the book of Leviticus, and there's lots of what seems to us silly and ridiculous rules there. Um, but they all have a purpose as it comes to the new covenant and Jesus fulfilling that. So the reason I don't want you to flip over is because there are really seven of them. And I want to see how many you guys can name. I wouldn't be able to name more than probably two. So if that makes you feel better. Of the thieves? Yeah. I wasn't going to put it out there again. I already said one. So Passover is one, yes. Oh, what was the one that they had to um, camp in the tents? The shelters. Yeah. That's. That's not Passover. Sukkot. Yeah, Sukkot is, is the feast of the tabernacles. That's it. There you go. We got two of them. Guys are wrong. You're doing good. <laughs> the feast of the golden corral. <laughs> no. That one. I don't want to be part of that feast. <laughs> that's, that's also known as the food poisoning feast. Yeah, for real. <laughs> it is on fire. I'll give you a hint. The bonus one is a, is one that they do every week. Communion. Mm -hmm. No, Jewish. Uh, Jew, uh, that Jews do every week. There's a chosen episode called that. Is there? Mm -hmm. Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat. Uh, Sabbath. Yeah. So that's our bonus one. We'll talk is, about that one. Is Yom Kippur one of them? Yes, Yom Kippur. You got three. Guys, you're doing better than I would have. I told you the ones chosen taught me. Yep, there you go. All right, well, we can just jump into them then. Um, so let's look. You can turn your paper over now. We're going to look at the seven oh, feasts and festivals. Um, <clears throat> so not all of these are feasts. Actually, a few of them are represented by fasting, which I think is significant oh. in its own way. I just went to edit and realized it was actually over. Okay. <laughs> Front and back. Sorry, I meant to print them all First one sided, fruits. but that didn't oh, yeah. happen. And a cost, duh. Yeah, I, you know? I forgot 11 bread. Fun I fact, and don't tell anyone this because they could take away my credentials. Not really, but I think it makes me a bad pastor. I didn't realize that Pentecost was an Old Testament thing before it was a New Testament thing. But you know, God works that way, so that's really cool. So if you don't know that, feel better because I also didn't know that, and I'm supposed to know those kind of things. So well, it's fine. Yeah, they were celebrating the Feast of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given, but then as New Testament Pentecostals, we look to that particular celebration of it. Yeah. And Acts 2, oh, but. Didn't know that. So yeah, so we'll jump into that, but before we get into the specifics of each, um, I put a few notes at the top for you there, um, that God establishes a cycle of feasts for Israel to observe throughout the year, creating habits and practices that structure Israel's life together in two ways. The first way is all of these feasts serve as a way to regularly participate in praise, to regularly participate in thanksgiving, in remembrance and in repentance. So in praise, thanksgiving, remembrance, and repentance. Uh, so the cool thing about these, these meals and these feasts and festivals and these things that they did every single year. It's okay. Camera. Oh, spelling is hard today. It's okay. Um, is that as they did it, it wasn't just remembering the ideas of what happened. It was really helping for them to actively form into the people, uh, into a people of God that are grateful, believing, um, their trusting community who shares in God's goodness in life. Because as they're actively praising God, as they're actively giving thanks to God, that, those sort of things really start to transform your heart and become who you are. So they weren't just a time of remembrance. They, they were that. But it was something that they actively practiced to um, keep themselves growing as a people of God and constantly going back to him as the author of life. And so that's the first purpose. The second one is that they continually remind his people of the covenant established with them through taste, sound, smell, touch, and sight. Um, and this is something that 
I don't know that we do a whole lot in our culture, but have you ever been to like a 4D theater? like at Disney World or something. And it's so much of a different experience than it is to just sit in a movie theater and watch the same thing because it's, it's a whole experience. You're smelling things. You know, sometimes if you go to the, the Tree of Life and in uh, Animal Kingdom, you feel bugs lines. crawling on your back and it freaks you out, you know? Like it's a whole, yeah, something spraying in your face. It's just a whole different experience. And so... The, the feasts and festivals, all of the, the things that they did were very symbolic, and it was all very sensory. You touch it, you break the bread, you drink this thing, you smell that thing, so that you are using your whole self, your whole person, as a reminder of these things that God has done. Um, so it's not just a mental reminder. And what is it reminding us of? Well, it's a reminder to stay faithful to the God who gives us life. It's reminding us that he is ultimately the life giver, that anything else that we put our faith and trust in is ultimately going to bring death and that we are looking to him to bring life. And so those are the two big purposes for these feasts and festivals. Uh, and so all of these are the, I guess the establishing of them is going to be found in Leviticus 23. So if you want to turn there for reference, I may read, whoops, I may read a few things um, from there tonight, but all of these are kind of just back to back to back. Leviticus 23, establishing them um, as appointed by God. Anybody who says God is a fun sucker should read Leviticus 23 because he gives them seven whole holidays, days off. So what is, all I'm saying. What is Purim? Well, that's a great question. There are other Jewish holidays that are not the original, like these here. Like uh, Hanukkah is is not one of these seven, but it is prophesied in like uh, Daniel or something like that. I don't know. <coughs> so I remember Phil Kashat talking about Purim. Purim. Um, P U R A M. So it looks like more of a historical uh, holiday. It celebrates the saving of the Jewish people from Haman. Um, oh, Esther Mordecai Haman. Yeah, yeah, and it's related to Hanukkah. That's what it says. So, good question. Didn't know, but Google can always tell you the answers. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so they're all found in Leviticus 23. And they're grouped into two groups. So there are the spring festivals and feasts, and there are the fall ones. Um, and the spring holy days happen kind of all together and within a 50-day uh, time span from March to June. And so all of the holy days uh, kind of switch around every year because they have a different calendar than us. They actually go by the lunar calendar. And so that's why they're never quite the same. Um, and so the spring ones happen from March to June, and the fall ones happen in September and or October. And like I said, they follow the lunar cycles. So we're going to go over the spring feast first. Um, and there is kind of a big difference between the spring feast and the fall feast that we'll get to in just a second. But the first one to kick it off is Passover or Pesach. I don't know if I'm pronouncing any of these Hebrew words right, but I'm going to try. So, Josiah, we're here. We Josiah would probably read them very It might well. not be right, but it would sound really cool. It would cool. sound really, yeah. really cool. I believe it. So this one is established in Levit Leviticus 23, 5. So I'll read that one for you. The Lord's Passover begins at sundown on the 14th day of the first month. So it establishes very clearly here when Passover is supposed to be. Now, who can tell me what Passover represents? Most of us hopefully should know that one. And God delivered the children of Israel um, from Egypt, and he gave all the plagues. The last plague was the death of the firstborn, and he asked the, uh, the Israelites to put blood on the top and the sides of the doorposts so that the death angel would pass over them and not kill them. 
And then they celebrated that, how he gave them life and delivered them every year after that. Correct. Correct Amanda. Ten points to Gryffindor. I already have a marker. I'm a Slytherin. Oh, sorry. Ten points to Slytherin. Tasha was trying to give herself points. I was trying to give myself points. Don't give Slytherin okay. points. All right. I'm just going to jot down a few things here. Right You're welcome to jot down you. anything else that while I'm talking or whatever, but just so we can establish. So this one is in Leviticus 23.5 is where it's established. Um, but the word Pesach, the Hebrew word, actually means to jump over. So he's right. It was talking about the 10th plague that God sends upon Egypt when, you know, he's trying to free his people and how he sends the angel of death. And anyone who put the blood of the lamb over their door, that angel would pass over. Um, and so sometimes this is called the Feast of Salvation. Um, and redemption is a huge, huge theme here. Um, and this is probably the most elaborate of all of, particularly the meals that we find in the feasts and festivals. Um, everything is symbolic and everything has a purpose. And it begins with a cleansing of your house. So we kind of think of Passover just as the, the Seder meal, but it actually begins days before that they start cleaning out anything in their house that has leaven or yeast um and do you guys know why or what leaven or yeast represents sin yeah so it does it represents sin um and so that's why they would um take anything that had leaven and they would clear out of their house that's part of the commandment and so um, it would symbolize, ultimately, our need for spiritual cleansing and repentance. So it's almost this reset every year. Um, and so, of course, it begins with a Seder dinner. Has anyone gotten to experience, like, a Seder, a Seder Passover meal dinner? I, we did one a long time ago in our church that I remember when I was really, really little. When we first got to the bridge, we did one. We took a Sunday night. And uh, everybody come back and sat around tables and explained everything and had the food on it and the bitter herbs and all of this stuff. Yeah. And then we did it when you were even smaller at that at our last church. That's the one I actually Phil, remember. Phil Kashad did it. Yeah. So um, it's something that still sometimes Christians will do because it has a lot of significance. So like I said, most of these are pointing back to something while also pointing forward and prophesying about Jesus or the end times or whatever it may be. Um, so with the Seder dinner and the Passover, everything has a deep, deep significance. So they have unleavened bread. Um, and if you've ever seen matzah, it almost looks like a big old saltine cracker. And they use it as um, an illustration, or now they use it as an illustration of uh, not just not having sin in your life, but it's actually a picture of Jesus. And so there's holes in it where he was pierced, and there are stripes on it where he was whipped. Um, and eventually you break the bread, and he is the bread of life who was broken for us. Um, the, the lamb that they eat obviously points, to, points back to the lamb that they slaughtered for the Passover, but it points forward to the, the perfect lamb who was slain for us. Um, there's four cups of wine that represent the four great promises given to Israel. Um, there's something called the matzah tash, which is that bread. You break it into three different sections, and then you take the middle piece, and you break it in half, and you go and hide it. And it's supposed to represent, that middle piece is supposed to represent Jesus, and that he's broken, and that he was hidden, but that he will come back. Um, and so even, like, all of this is established way before Jesus even comes. And so while it is really cool that it's this reminder of God's promises, it's, it's simultaneously a reminder of his promises to come. And so the cool thing about Passover is that it's not just the Seder dinner. It actually lasts for eight days um, and the Passover dinner is just the first one. And so it goes in conjunction with the next um, festival holiday, which is the one of unleavened bread. Did I spell that right? I don't know. Yes. Okay. So unleavened bread. <clears throat> so this starts it, and then you have seven more days where you are no longer eating anything that has leaven in it. And so this one is found in just the next um, 
The next verse in Leviticus 23, 6. Um, <coughs> and so the reason that they did this was because unleavened bread eaten over a period of time, it symbolized holiness or a holy walk with God. And so, um, you know, for them, it was, again, just a time of cleansing of, um, I wouldn't say quite fasting, but denying themselves in a way of, of the sin of the world um, and reminding themselves that, that a walk with God is a walk without sin in our lives. Um, and so in a Christian sense, we can look back at this and know that the unleavened bread, the matzah, symbolizes the body of our Lord and that he's called the bread of life. Pass me the butter, you know? Bethlehem literally means house of bread, if you didn't know that. So Jesus being born in Bethlehem is really significant. Um, Beit means house, and Lechem means bread, so it's literally it's a house of bread. Um, and he becomes be. the bread for us. What? That's where I'm trying to be. You're trying to be in, in the, the house, house of, bread. of bread? You should start a bakery called the house of bread. <laughs> That'd be amazing. <laughs> Um, yeah, so unleavened bread is basically just a continuation of Passover. So then we get to the first fruits celebration. And this one is found in Leviticus 23, 9 through 14. And some of these, as we get into later ones, are going to have more details and things that you're welcome to go back and read. I'm just not going to hash all of that out tonight. Um, so this one comes right on the heels of Passover. Like these are all boom, 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 right? One right after the, the other. Um, and this is for, uh, what's, a, what's a short way to say this? Uh, basically like... Thanking God for his provision. Like, God has provided for us. We'll just say that. God has provided for us. So, really, um, the feast is for acknowledging the fertility of the land that God had given to Israel. It's all around um, the first harvest. And it literally means the counting the sheaf. Counting of the sheaf, which is like their their grain. So this is this isn't so much first fruits of like um, our livestock. This is more the harvest, like our grain, the, the first harvest that we have in the spring. Um, and so this is when they would bring their first grains, their first crops, and they would use it as a sacrifice and an offering to God. Um, and so this one is less of a feast, but it's more we give God this first before we feast upon any of the things that we have harvested. We give God our first fruits. Um, and a lot of times we'll refer to this, first fruits is a phrase we may have heard as Christians. Um, we use it when we're talking about tithes and giving God our best of our time and our money and our talents. Um, and really for them, it is the same for us, that it's more of an exercise for their hearts and their trust in God and practicing those things, praise and thanksgiving and training them to have those things in their heart than it is for God who doesn't actually need their wheat or our money or however you want to see it. Um, and so this one consists of a lot of prayers and so this marks the beginning of a 50-day period until the last Pentecost, the last um, spring feast and festival. And so they would pray every day, starting the first one, they would say, today is the first of the sheaf. And then the next day, this, today is the second day of the sheaf. And so they would go on and on and on until we get to 50, which is Pentecost. Um, and it's looking forward to the next harvest. That's really what Pentecost was. So it was almost a God, I'm giving you my first fruits. I'm celebrating that you have provided for us. And we are going to look forward and count forward to the next harvest that we have, to the next time that you're going to provide for us. Um, and so looking forward even bigger in a bigger picture than that, it's foreshadowing the resurrection of the Messiah, 
because in 1 Corinthians, we know that Paul calls Jesus the first fruits of all believers. He's the first one who died. So again, this is just establishing something good and great that God was doing for the people, but still always pointing forward to Jesus and who he was going to be. So then the last spring festival that we have is the festival of Pentecost, which like we said is 50 days after. Um, and this is also called, and I have this on your paper there, the latter first fruits, not later, latter first fruits. Um, because again, like I said, this is, you know, our very first fruits, but we're coming to another time of harvest. This one is found in Leviticus 23, 15 through 21. Um, and like I said, it marks the summer harvest. This one actually did include um, their animals as well. So it wasn't just their grains. It was animals and livestock and anything that they had raised. And so um, this one, like several of them, kicks off with a celebratory meal. And it would include things um, like challah bread, which is the, if you've ever oh. seen it, the bread that is braided, mm -hmm. which represents, we know now, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, they would use milk products because scripture is the milk of the world. So if you like cheesecake, this is your Jewish holiday. They would have such things. I don't know if they had it then, but like today's Jewish families will use things like cheesecake. Um, and this one really is all about the promise of more. Because although, what was that? One bit of cheap milk. I don't know. I feel like at this point in time, you could probably get away with any kind of cheese product that you want. So that was fine. Um, <laughs> so it's the promise of more because in the Jewish culture, there's still the fall harvest to come. They're still looking forward to the more that comes beyond um, just what they're seeing in the summer there. But um, just a little history lesson for you here. Pentecost is actually super cool because some Jewish scholars believe that um, it was the day, like the calendar, before this day was even established as a holiday, the calendar established that this was the time that Moses was getting the law on Mount Sinai. It's when he was receiving the law from God. Um, and when he was up on the mountain receiving the law, do you guys remember what the Israelites were doing down at the camp? Living camp. Making a cow, making a golden cow. Um, and so because of their disobedience, 3,000 people died that day, lost their lives. And that whole story of Moses receiving the law, there's 3,000 people um, who are kind of punished. And it's almost as if they are under the weight of the law. And so it's kind of this symbolic, as, as they celebrate Pentecost every year, they would tell this story of them creating the golden calf um, as Moses receives the law. And it was a reminder, I mean, first of all, don't be stupid and like make a golden calf. But second of all, like there's, there's a promise of more. There's got to be more than just the law. And this is what, what Israel was always looking for, the promise of more, the promise of more, the promise of more. And so when we look to the story of Pentecost in the New Testament, we know that Jesus has already told his disciples there's, there's something or someone greater than me who is coming. And we know that that's the Holy Spirit. Um, and so Pentecost is happening, like you said, it's 50 days after Jesus has risen from the dead because Jesus is all lining up with this timeline as his crucifixion goes. He dies on Passover. Um, he was buried on the, the unleavened bread. He uh, was raised on the first fruits. And then he has already gone into heaven, but on Pentecost is when we see the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And how many people were added to their numbers that day? Does anybody remember? 3,000. 3,000. 3,000, the same number that died because of their disobedience in the Old Testament. And so Pentecost, as I have discovered now learning that it is also an Old Testament holiday, is actually the Pentecost that we now celebrate and we recognize is this great redemption from God 
of, of the weight of the law was just so heavy and these people couldn't wait for it and they built this cow and it was terrible but there was always the promise of more and so the more came and and those same three that not the same three thousand but that same number of people um, were added back to that number so God you know wasn't just they weren't just celebrating a regular harvest at this point they were celebrating the spiritual harvest of all of these people um, so I just thought that was a pretty cool little tidbit because God brings things back around in, in crazy ways. Um, and so these are the first four of the celebrations. And now the difference that we find in the first four and the last four is like I said, when, when we look at the calendar of these and in Jesus's life, it's crucifixion, burial, resurrection, and then the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is the fulfillment. He has fulfilled all of the spring festivals. He, they have come full circle. He has redeemed them. Their purpose has been made known. Um, and so he's fulfilled all four of these. But he has not yet fulfilled the fall festivals and feasts. And so that's where we find the break in the middle in between them and so like we said all of these happen from march to june and then there's this break in time where nothing happens until about september october and that break in time is supposed to represent the period of time that we're in now it's supposed to represent the church um, and our our work in the kingdom and so then the fall feasts and festivals represent when jesus comes back and a couple different days there okay can you say that one more time crucifixion so, oh, yeah. So crucifixion. In the grave. Buried. Resurrection. And then Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to pause there, actually. That was just a lot that I threw at you. Okay. It was good. Okay. It was really good. Just want to make sure you got everything and I didn't go too fast. You think we do spring cleaning because of the Feast of Unleavened Bread? I probably think so. I think it probably spring. has ties to it. Crucifixion, that's what's in the crucifixion. I was thinking about it when we were talking about it gray. being in the spring. Yeah. Yeah, so next time you do spring cleaning, just get rid of all your, rid of all your bread. bread. No bagels for you for eight whole days. Only unleavened bread. Oh. I wonder if English muffins are considered unleavened. They're pretty flat. They're pretty flat. I think they're decent. English muffins? Got to put a little butter on it first and then the peanut butter on top. And some honey. This pen. No, just pile the peanut butter on top. It died? Oh, that's sad. Is it like the peanut butter jelly mixture? Because that's not good. Oh, it is so good. Yeah, crucifixion. You know what I'm talking about? Burial. 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 That's what it's I'm not saying. Bougie. Crucifixion, burial, <laughs> resurrection. Yeah, we and ain't then. fancy like that over here. We gotta just squirt our honey on top. <laughs> and then the place. <laughs> yeah. I went backwards. Hmm. I'm not good. I'm not good. I'm not good. It'd be a lie. <laughs> Fall festival, yeah. Yay, yeah. fall festival, woohoo! Okay, so it's the first fall, one that we have is the feast of <laughs> it's, it's fall, y'all. It's fall, y'all. <laughs> All right, so the first one is the feast of trumpets. Um, and the the command, the scripture, whatever you want to call it, for this one is going to be Leviticus 23 23 through 25. Um, and this one is the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. You might hear it called. <laughs> Jewish New Year. Um, and much like our New Year, it is a time of reflection. Um, it's a time of repentance, which is probably the biggest theme here. Time of reflection, repentance. Um, and kind of a regathering of your faith in God. Again, a lot of cleansing here. 
So where our new year, you know, there's a lot of people who say, oh, I want to get back in church. Or it's a time where we look back and we're starting anew. But unlike our new year, it is very much focused on renewing our faith in God and cleansing ourselves again, um, and mostly through repentance. And so, again, this includes a festival dinner, but it's a lot about prayer. Um, and again, that prayer is all about the idea of repentance. And ultimately, what this represents is the rapture, um, when we're looking forward, the event that is to come that Jesus has not fulfilled quite yet. But it's when, um, you know, we said this is a spiritual regathering for yourself. It also represents the spiritual regathering of all of God's people. When he will come back and he will gather all of his people unto himself. And so during this, they actually blow a shofar several times. Um, and it's supposed to symbolize that a time of repentance is near. So it's, it's almost like a warning, like, hey, let's remember that any day now, like, God is coming to regather his people to himself, and so we should be in a time of repentance. Um, and so that's the fall festival feast of the trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. And I believe there's only 10 days in between this and the next one. Um, the next one is the Festival of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. This one is found in Leviticus 23, 27. Um, and this is a day of confession. And some people call this the highest of holy days. The day of confession, the highest of holy days. Um, in Jewish culture, this is when um, the high priest would go into the holy of holies and kind of take the sins of the people um, and do sacrifices for all of the people. So not only is it a day of confession, it is a day of, um, I guess, kind of repentance, redemption. Um, and if you want to uh, go into any details of how this happens and like the procedures of how they do this that's found in Leviticus 16 if you're interested in looking at that um, but basically what would happen is they would take two goats and one of them they would sacrifice like normal um, and then one of them they would pray over and almost transfer the sins of the people to that goat and instead of sacrificing it, they would like send it off into the wilderness. So it was supposed to represent uh, the sins of the people being far from them. That's the scapegoat. That they were yeah. Yes, it, scapegoat. it quite I'm literally sorry. was the scapegoat. That's where it came from. Um, and so this one starts with, again, with a festive meal. But this one is the only one where they are specifically commanded to do a fast. So starting, they have a big meal because the, the Jewish day starts at sundown. So they would have a big meal right before sundown, and then for 24 hours, they would not eat. Um, and this is a true fast, like no food, no water, no nothing for 24 hours. Um, and again, it was this cleansing period where they were fervently praying that their name would be put into the book of life. That's what it was about. Um, and so the cool thing about this one is that in, even if you're a, a Messianic Jew or as a Christian, this is one that almost doesn't count for us or that we don't practice anymore or doesn't apply to us. Not because we're so great and so awesome and we don't have to follow this rule, but because we know that Jesus has already paid the atonement for our sins. Um, and so we don't really practice this one um, as much as we can celebrate and practice the other ones. Um, but if we ever do celebrate the Day of the Atonement or Yom Kippur, it should be in hopes and excitement for the fulfillment of that. Because we're still kind of living in the in-between where Jesus has paid the price, he's paid the atonement, but we haven't yet seen that fulfilled or that really come full circle in our lives. And so... 
while we may not use this as a day of, of being somber and fasting and waiting for the atonement that's already happened, it can be a day where we remember and are thankful for that um, and, and, and await that in the future. And so the last, the last one. What does that represent? Is it the judgment, great white throne judgment? Like the rapture? The, so. You know, the death and resurrection all that? <clears throat> I, mean, I kind of guess, yeah, I guess it probably does represent the judgment a little bit. Um, because if you have Jesus, then you don't have to worry about it. you got confession. You know, everything gets confessed before. I just, right. I was trying to figure it out. I've never no, seen that yeah. lined up like that. So I. No, I actually didn't run into any, like, this correlates with this specific event. But if I had to choose, I would think it would be the day of judgment. That's what I'm right now because I need something. And okay, you gotta, you got to check that box. <laughs> yeah, it's the day of judgment. There you go. Where Great we will judge. come before God and give an account for all the things we've done, but thankfully and graciously we will be seen through the blood of we've Jesus. We've been atoned for. We have been atoned. Yes. So the last one um, that we find in the fall is the feast or festival of the tabernacles. And this is the one that uh, Stephanie said earlier where they build, they build little houses and they actually do. Um, so in uh, Judaism, this is supposed to celebrate when God provided shelter for the Israelites. So built it in the, in the wilderness and how he provided the tabernacle. Um, and each year they do. They build little booths or shelters um, outside of their houses. And um, some people will sleep in them. Some people do not. Uh, but they basically, they choose to worship God in those places as a reminder um, of, of God's providence in their lives. And it's also, I'm going to write the word dwelling. Um, it's a big focus upon the tabernacle as the dwelling place of God. That the Torah and, and the Ark of the Covenant was in there. And this, that's where God's spirit dwelled. Um, and now we see that as God's spirit dwells amongst us as well. Um, and so just as a side note, like historically, since so many of these are around harvest, this is also the fall harvest. So think of this almost as the Jewish Thanksgiving, if that makes sense. I know that's not a, a biblical point in time, but you can put Thanksgiving in your checkbox if you want. <laughs> oh, I would think it would be like when the new heaven and the new earth, because we will dwell with God forever. He will. That's, 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 that's good. good. That's good. Yes. But. When we got rapture, I was figuring out the other two, trying to think ahead. Yeah, so um, it is, it, but I guess you could also say it, it also represents when Jesus came and dwelt among the people. The word came and dwelt among his people. But yes, that eventually one day we will be in the, we will always be in the dwelling place of God. Um, that we will always be in his presence um, one day in the future. And so those are the seven there. Um, and I gave you a little bonus, a bonus Sabbath. Um, and this is one we hear about, sorry, that's terrible handwriting. Um, this one we hear about more often, but basically um, the significant thing to, to point out here um, is that the Sabbath meal happens every single week. Um, and Sabbath rest happens every single week. And so it is this ongoing dependence upon God. That's really what it's for. And I think, if I have this correctly, all of the holidays start on Shabbat. They all start on a Sabbath. Um, so not only is it a holy day every single week where we um, fully depend on God, it's also the start date for all of these different feasts and festivals. And it's almost a weekly cum culmination of these festivals and what they represent um, in, in people's lives and in the lives of God's people. So. Um, that's just a little extra bonus one for you there. But there you have it. There are the seven feasts and festivals. Um, and that is just a super quick 
flyover of all of those things. I tried my best to give you um, the significance of them without going too deeply into the weeds. Um, but as you can see, even though we look at it from a Christian perspective and it's so deep in meaning for us, you can see how even before Jesus came, God's people would gather and do these things every single year. And it was just this practice of reminding them over and over again and helping them practice over and over again to praise God, to be thankful to God, um, and be reminded of his promises. Uh, and so, although we don't celebrate a lot of these um, in the Christian church, I hope that you can see the significance in them, um, and I hope if you have not been able to experience a Passover Seder meal or anything like that, that maybe this coming year you could find one um, and get to experience that for yourself, because it really is, it's a really cool experience. It's a whole 4D theater experience of who God is and what he's done, not just for us under the new covenant, but for his people under the old covenant as well. We should do one. At the Pastor Daniel did one this yeah, year Yeah, he did one Nexus. for Nexus. And we've talked about possibly doing one for the church around Easter-ish time next year, possibly. What? Yeah, yeah. he did the whole thing walking for us. He did. It is like a cracker. Which we did the demonstration of the matzah at our our group. We did our bread group. We did. Pretty cool. Um, so technically we are supposed to end in one minute, but I want to make sure if you have any questions or concerns, you guys want to talk about any of that stuff or anything you thought was cool that you have an opportunity to do that. So. I thought you did a great job. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good. Very, very thorough. Yeah. Thorough but very good, very deep, but very easily understood uh -huh. okay, at good. the same time. You can really get in the weeds with these. You can. Here. So. Um, I did just want to, sometimes you will see things. Uh, you know, billboards and things that say going to church on Sunday is the mark of the beast. <laughs> yes. and, and about Sabbath, it made me think of that. Um, and those come from certain churches um, that believe that, I mean, you got to go to church on Saturday because that was the traditional Jewish Sabbath. Um, but for us at the bridge and what we believe um, is that, you know, there is a Sabbath. But we celebrate it on the Lord's Day, is what it's called when Jesus came back. On the Lord's Day, we're celebrating the Lord's Day as our Sabbath. And you know, when people want to get with me, they're like, you're supposed to rest on the Sabbath. I said, I know. I'm a pastor. I work on Sunday, so I, sell, I rest on Saturday. So that's why we go to church on Sunday. But um, we look at it as the Lord's Day, and then it is more of a, um, an idea that we should follow, but not necessarily it is this space in time. Some people, because of their job and because of culture, they work on the weekends, but it's setting a time of rest. If you can do it on that specific day, great, but we feel like that God's not so, like, got to do it here and doesn't count. But find somewhere where you do rest and where you can get recharged and where you can spend some time with him and you know, not just be so work, 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 because, I mean, our culture and our society pushes that anyway. Mm -hmm. So if I just thought I'd throw that out there because just recently that was up somewhere. And, uh, it's I, in Habersham County, right by Walmart. There is, but you can also go to restaurants and you know the different things that come on in, you know, in certain restaurants and they flip different advertisements. One of them is like, yeah, going to church on Saturday or Sunday is the mark of the beast. And it's like, because I had someone go, what, what is that? What is... Yeah. So that's what we believe uh, at the bridge. I mean, you know, there are things that we're probably right on, probably things that we're wrong on, but that's why we celebrate it then and feel okay with it, that we're doing it on the Lord's Day, but it's more of a find that time in your week principle than it's got to be done from this sundown to this sundown. All right. Thank you. 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 Well, I'm going to read a table blessing for us again today. It I may downloaded that, but I didn't have table blessings. I had some other blessings. There's, there's a, there's a category for table uh, blessings. I just looked at it real and fast. And it may so. say something about food. I haven't read it yet, but if it does, you know. You know what we're here for. Give me just a second. Pull it up. My liturgy is about table blessings. See, there you go. If you would like to pull it up and read along, you're more than welcome to. This is Tuesdays? This is Monday. Oh, this is, that's this right. This is Monday. 
And actually, I thought it was it weird say. last night to be Sunday night. It's usually yeah. midday. They're designed to off. do um, like call and response, but I'm not gonna make you do that. So just FYI, if you if you are reading, like they're very liturgical. They're they're pretty cool, but um, yeah. So I'm gonna pray. Oh God, our rock, we thank you that you did not leave us rudderless and tossed by storms in this life, but have graciously given us in your word and in the witness of the life and words of your son, a true mooring for our own lives, a true anchor for our souls. Your words are life to us, Lord Christ. Even as we hunger for the tastes and textures and aromas of the meal, that was graciously spread before us an hour ago. We pray you would also daily increase our deep hunger for your words and your truth, that our own words and choices and actions this week would be shaped by your grace, gracious revelation. Feed us, O bread of life. Amen. Amen.